reading from Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 50. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I am honored to be here with all of you this evening as you have come together to contemplate some of the events of your Savior's suffering and death. I understand that this time in your church year is a blessing for you as Christians. I believe you call it Lent. From what I understand, Lent is a time for Christians to slow down a little bit and pay particular attention to the events that occurred 2,000 years ago, during the week when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, fulfilled the purpose of his incarnation, his life on earth as a man. I also know that this Lent you have been hearing about that amazing day in history which has become known as Good Friday, although it is only by faith that anyone could call that day a good day. So from that perspective, it is very aptly named Good Friday. You've been hearing from some of the items that were involved in that day's events, items that played a role in leading to the sacrificial death of Jesus for the sins of the entire world. You have heard from the flogging whip, the crown of thorns, a nail, and of course, the cross. I have been also asked to come and share some of my own thoughts and experiences from that day since I too was very directly involved in the crucifixion event. I am the sponge. Do you remember me? So I would like to point out a, a difference, though, between my role compared to the other items that you have heard from so far. The one major difference between me and the other items from that day is that they were intended to inflict pain and punishment on Jesus, whereas someone was actually using me to provide a bit of relief for him. They were responding to the time when he cried out from the cross, I am thirsty. His body had lost a lot of fluid, water, and blood. He was clearly in a state of dehydration. And so when he could stand it no longer, he cried out, I am thirsty. So somebody, I'm not sure who it was, felt some compassion on him, and they took hold of me and dropped me into a small basin of wine vinegar which was kind of like a cheap version of wine in those days. And I did my thing as a sponge. I soaked it up until I was totally saturated with the wine vinegar. Then I remember being stuck onto the end of a hyssop plant. Obviously, it was long enough to be lifted up to the height where Jesus could reach it with his mouth. And he slowly, very weakly, siphoned a little bit of liquid from my poorest body. I'm sure that water would have been his first choice as a drink rather than cheap wine. I mean, when you're thirsty, really thirsty, don't you really just want water? There are a couple of things about my role on that day that I believe are worth mentioning to you as those who have placed their faith in this Jesus of Nazareth who died on the cross that day. I know that you believe that his death means something pretty amazing and powerful for you and that he was dying in order to remove the power of sin in your life, the power to separate you from God for all eternity. His death was more than just another crucifixion. I had seen many crucifixions in my day, but none like this. Something was definitely different about this one. To begin with, I find it ironic and a bit humbling, to know that I was used to quench the thirst of this Jesus, 
even though it was only just enough to moisten his lips and his tongue just a little bit. The ironic and humbling part of it is the fact that this was the same Jesus who compared himself to water, living water. He's the one who said to the woman at the well, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in the book of Revelation, John also talks about that wonderful invitation where he says, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. The amazing part of that invitation is that it is only possible because Jesus became dehydrated on the cross. In other words, he became thirsty on the cross so that your thirst would be quenched. That is, that your thirst for God and for righteousness would be quenched. This is why it was so humbling for me to presume to quench the thirst of someone who is the source of living water. But he was also a man. He was just as much a human being as he was God, which is why his thirst on the cross was real. After bleeding and suffering for so many hours, he was as thirsty as any human being could be. I remember that as I touched his lips and tongue, they were drier than any mouth I had ever come in contact with before. You would think that he would have just kept me in his mouth for as long as possible, but it seemed that he just needed me for a short moment. I didn't really figure that part out until right after he had his small drink. It was almost immediately after he had moistened his lips and tongue that he spoke again from the cross for the last time. And what he said was utterly amazing. No doubt those words remain the most important three words ever spoken in history. Do you remember those words? They were spoken for you. They are words of power and grace for every person who has ever lived or will live. They are the words, it is finished. It being his mission, the reason that he came into the world. He came into the world to pay for the sins of all people. He was born to die. Those words, it is finished, are meant to be taken to heart by you as believers. There is nothing left to do for your salvation. The job has been completed. So as soon as Jesus said those words, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Something powerful had just happened. The sinless Son of God accepted the wrath of God in your place. So what does all of this have to do with me, the sponge that was lifted up to Jesus' lips? Well, I can't prove it or anything, but I kind of feel as though I played an important role in that moment. If you've ever had a very dry mouth before, maybe when you've been sick or just waking up in the morning, then you know how difficult it is to form your words very clearly because your mouth is so dry. Well, just imagine how it was for Jesus. So it makes me wonder, since Jesus was about to die, why he wanted that drink so badly. Maybe, just maybe, he wanted his mouth to be moist enough so that he could say with ultimate clarity and for all to hear and without mistake what it was that he was about to proclaim, those three words, it is finished. And so there I was, a sponge, the perfect instrument to make it possible for him to proclaim those amazing words. If that was my role that day, or even the purpose for my existence as a sponge, then I am honored to have existed. And if the reason that Jesus wanted that drink was just so that he was able to speak those words with clarity and certainty, then that would tell me that he only expressed his thirst for your sake. It would, be, it would only be another minute or two before he would die, so his thirst would be gone but he needed to proclaim for your sake and for the world's sake that his mission was completed. The price was now paid for sin. 
Of course, I have no way of proving that this was his reason for wanting a drink, but it does sound just like you're Jesus, doesn't it? Thinking about you and not himself, just as he had done from all eternity. It was his plan from all along to endure the cross for you. Amen.